XOXO Homegrown. XOXO Homegrown. It's all of us, of us. Hi, it's Ken from XOXO Homegrown, and we're here today at Smog City Brewing in Torrance. And Lori and Porter, as he likes to be called Porter Porter, a great name for a brewer, are here with me. And they are just about to celebrate their second anniversary in this location and their three and a half anniversary as a company brewing beer. Right, so uh, we, we celebrate here it's basically almost two years to the day we opened the tap room, which was when we started uh, making and selling beer from this location. Uh, but the, uh, the October 2011 was the, the time when we actually started selling beer as a company, as Smog City. Yeah. Out of Tustin. Out of Tustin, yeah. Out of Tustin at the time. Yeah. At some point in your lives you met. True. Yeah. And this was not in California. Nope. Correct. It was where and how we no, met sir. in college. We were uh, going to school in Philadelphia, same major, same year, um, but we were on opposing schedules, and so we would sort of cross paths. We were never really in the same class until our senior, senior year. year. And when then they, senior when they both, year. Both uh, tracks oh. sort of they get came mashed together. together, and then you do all your final projects and things, so you, yeah. and you what meet the other you half. This? Uh, photography. Photography. Yeah. Right. Of, so, course. of course. Of course. And, it's perfect. Right. And in some strange, predictive manner, he set up a Wednesday night senior crit get-together at the White Dog to drink pitchers of craft beer with the entire <laughs> class. And so even if we didn't know each other, um, if we didn't all know each other, we all kind of had this great opportunity to really socialize once a week. And that's where I got to know him because he would stand at the head of the table and he would be the one ordering all the craft beer and and sort of controlling this group. And he was very quiet and shy in class, but he was very magnanimous and, and, and had tons magnetic. of magnetic and had this character that, that kind of was hidden during the class and then came out when he was in this social environment. And so that's when I got yeah, interested. The, the, the shy photographer stereotype. Yeah. Now yeah. what, what year was this? Uh, 2001. 2001. And what craft beers were available at that time? Well, this was Pennsylvania, so uh, we were in Philadelphia. We are getting a lot of stuff, uh, Flying Fish in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, Yards in Philadelphia. Uh, we were going to, uh, what's the, Dock Street Brew Pub? Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, uh, who else? Victory was uh, just outside the city, so we were yeah. drinking a lot of Hop Double. Did, did Yingling qualify? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, well not so was, much on those evenings, but yeah, not so much for those. Most of the time, uh, yeah, that was the go-to. Right. I mean, you go into a bar in Philly, you say, "I want a lager." They just bring you a Yingling. Uh -huh. okay. You don't have to order. Okay. You don't have to say what it is. Yeah, you don't have to say what kind of beer it is. And and for those who don't know, um, because you're not in the Pennsylvania and neighboring states uh, environment, Yingling is the largest. American-owned brewery in the country, yep. and I'd imagine, um, with all deference to uh, Mr. Cook at Boston Beer, that Dick Yinling is the richest brewer in the country. <laughs> Possibly. Could be. I don't know. He owns 100%, and right. I think they're doing the same volume, more or less, as Boston Beer, mm -hmm. which is Sam Adams. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, there's, there's some surprising things there. And of course, Dick took it over from his dad mm -hmm. and was pretty much told to dump the thing and don't do this <laughs> and turned it around. Wow, that's awesome to hear. That's good, yeah. I'm, I'm glad he did. <laughs> now, when did you decide to go from photography and beer nights to actually saying, brewing is something I want to do for a livelihood? Uh, that's a long road traveled. So uh, we made it to LA in 2002 and uh, I started home brewing in 2003. Um, Lori was uh, f working in freelance photography and I was working for, on the print side, uh, which I had continued from when I was in college. And uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I love home brewing. We love to cook and I just got, I found something to do on the evenings and weekends that really, you know, caught my attention and, mm -hmm. and I just developed this immense passion for it. 
And uh, Are you both bakers and brewers. Oh, I, we both love to cook. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I have not ever brewed a beer, a batch of beer in my life. That's true. He asked me to make wine back in the beginning, and I was like, I don't want to make wine. I want to drink your beer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any interest. And with wine, it didn't seem as as complex and as scientific as beer is um, from the home brewing and home, yeah. you know, home vit- viticulture, you know, perspective. So I wasn't very interested and I just wanted him to make awesome beer so that we could have parties and hang out and <laughs> save some money. Yeah, I mean, I was brewing so much that like we couldn't drink it all. So we would just invite people to come over and try it and drink it and talk about it. And that sort of also developed our, where I started developing the knowledge on how to talk about beer and uh, sort of uncover what all of the flavors and styles mean. So at the same point, same time I was brewing a lot, I was educating myself. Mm-hmm. And then I sort of at this, um, ended up in a place where the job scene was going to be a dead end after a few years. Like I kind of hit the top, which wasn't very high. Now, what was that? I was working in the digital printing industry. Okay. Right, um, right. Yeah. So one of my one of the owners of the company told me that I couldn't was expect. Was this 2005? Five. Yeah, because I, I was involved with a few printers and they really peaked out big mm-hmm. time. In yeah. Five, six, and seven. Exactly, and so he told me, he's like, you're not, you know, I kept asking for a raise, I'm doing more, I want to I wanna, I wanna go up, what can I do? And he's like, you know, you're not really going to make much more than this. And I knew then that I couldn't do that forever. Right. And so we started thinking maybe, I mean, I got a lot of coaching from people after that day. And, uh, and, I think and one so of them was from, uh, I guess a little bit after that was Belmont, um, from, what's his name? Uh, Blackwell at Blackwell Belmont. Blackwell at Belmont. Belmont. He said, if you can afford to start a brewery, you should buy a, bu- a you building. Should buy real estate. estate. Mm-hmm. Well, that was, and that was like the year before the housing crash. Yeah. So we didn't do that. Good. Yes, so not, I enrolled in the American that. Brewers Guild. Uh, sometimes being slow is yeah. the secret. It's I, true. Sometimes one, missing how, the train is how you actually yeah. One could save even yourself. look at Sierra Nevada, not to be repeated, but we're filming. One, uh, <coughs> say being slow <coughs> yes. helped him an, out an awful lot. Absolutely. Uh, many people that started at the same time just succeeded. Ended up belly up. Yeah, yeah it's true. And he, he did too, almost. Right. Well, well they all, yeah. They Somebody all. the other day said to me, uh, they were saying, oh, Lagunitas, rah, rah, rah. Well, you, you know, um, um, Jerry there, McGee, McGee? Uh, Tony McGee? Tony McGee. Tony McGee. Yeah, Tony McGee was trying to sell Lagunitas at the early part of the century, 2001 or so, to yeah. Mendocino. Oh, now, yeah. look at how that's turned around. Right. Wow. He's trying to give it away. Amazing. Wow. And uh, they've surely changed places now. Mm-hmm. So you decided, you, you didn't come to California to be an entrepreneur. Well, I didn't really know what I wanted to okay. do. Okay. You came here for the weather? I mean, we're, we're here in May and I'm wearing my my uh, wool jacket and, and you were wearing your hoodie and you decided to divulge your curves. It is and uh, it's a cold day in May. It's snowing in Big Bear today. So, but you, you could have come for the weather. True. I, I, I came for her. Mm-hmm. Ah. Because I, I wanted to come to school out in California, and my mother wouldn't let me uh, go west of the Mississippi. And so I ended up in Philadelphia and immediately went into severe culture shock because I came from Florida where it was sunny and everyone was happy and they all look you in the eyes. And then I got up there, and it's a northeast city. It's kind of, you know, a little cold, a little rough. And I was tough on me, and so my mom was like, Whenever you want, you just you go wherever you want. I'm sorry. Sorry I forced you to stay on the East Coast. There's no reason. She's like, I don't even know why I did that. And so I told her, and I think that was my freshman year, I'm like, the minute I graduate, I'm going to California. And I did end up spending a co-op in San Francisco for six months, and I just loved it. I drove around, drove around with my smile on my face. I was really looking out the window. And sent back selfies to your mom. And there weren't selfies back then. That wasn't oh, a thing. Okay. I don't even think I had a cell phone that took pictures. I'm that old. No, do no. not have cell technology We are that old. So, uh, I so I knew I wanted to come back. And and then when we met, we started dating. And I think maybe four months into it, I was like, you know, it's really what we got going is this is really good. I'm going to California. So you want to come? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I told agreed. her, I, you know, I said, yeah, the I don't best have... yes of your life. I mean, right? this was right after college. I was like, I don't know where I'm, where I'm, what I'm doing, where I'm going. I was like, just give me some time to save some money, and I'll come with you. And I said, give me a year, and I was like, all right. So a year later, we moved to L.A. Yeah. You were mentored and counseled that maybe you should buy some real estate. Yeah. Maybe you should go into brewery business. 
And uh, somewhere you got the entrepreneurial bug to do that and started interning, as it were, yeah, well, with other people. After the American Brewers Guild uh, course, I sort of ingrained myself into every brewer, brewery owner, anybody I could find anywhere in the vicinity of Los Angeles. Like three hours. Because there weren't any. Yeah, I drove to Atalanto <laughs> and interned for a guy out there. It was, yeah, it's yeah. near, um, Yurgis. yeah, it's all the way up off the 15, yeah. uh, up the hill from. Adelanto's a, uh, how can I say this politely? Adelanto's a dump. Yeah. Right? Correct. It's, it was, a, it's an ex-army base, yes. but no army base there anymore. Right. And a lot of people who are no longer in the army and no longer receiving salaries. Yes. And um, you could buy real estate there yes. and do a brewery <laughs> for the, for the, for the taxes they owe. That's True. Right. Or less. <laughs> So, yeah, so I would try and get into anywhere. And so, I mean, the biggest thing about being an entrepreneur, I think, is that I was frustrated with the places, the people that I had worked for when they made decisions that I thought, you know, like I didn't agree with. And I'm like, well, if we did this, it would be better for us and the customer, those kinds of things. And, and as I, I sort of worked my way up the ladder in a, in a few different companies, and in the brewery side included, right, right. I knew that I wanted to work for myself. Okay. So that I could be the guy responsible and making the decisions, and now I realize that that's a lot harder than I thought it was. Right. <laughs> you realize that now. Uh huh. Yeah. At at the time. But it's still better. If I could just repeat what you said, the entrepreneurial bug was basically a a you wanted to be the boss to make the decisions, not just to be the boss, right. but no. because you perceived a right way to do things for the customer. Mm -hmm. For the customer, for the beer, if we're talking about breweries, yep. for the product. Uh -huh. And the only way to do that, as, as what occurred to you anyway, was to be your own boss, to be Correct. an entrepreneur, to start a business. Right. And so you go from, um, the, uh, me uh, me mention your, your path there. You, you mentioned the, the Guild course. The Guild, and then I interned a little bit with uh, Blackwell at Belmont Brewing Company mm -hmm. and Bonaventure. Bonaventure downtown, right? So he, he covers both, and right. so I would get up and join him at 4.30 in the morning and, and brew a little bit. Um, I also worked at that place in Adelanto a few times, which was crazy. What was that place? Are it was called Yurgis. It's a former um, New Belgium, early New Belgium employee huh. moved out and started a brewery there. It doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Yeah. I just found the t-shirt in my drawer though, which is as, kind as, of funny. As is true <laughs> much of Adelanto. Yeah, right. And there's a lot of breweries. <laughs> um, so I, inter I was interning there, uh, sort of trying experience. to get experience, right? Now, when did he fail? I don't remember. Okay, but not while you were there. But no. He, no, but he, he called you out because he had some sort of infection in his brewery. <laughs> And because uh, Porter had just finished the uh, Brewers Guild, he had some credentials to at least go in and try and help him do right. some problem solving. And, and figure so out that's where his where, problem was coming that's from. That's what he was doing out there, is he was helping this guy like kind of suss out his like problem solve. Right, not everybody realizes, but, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but 90% of brewery work is cleaning? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, not everybody realizes that. Or paying that. bills. Or paying, or yeah. Cleaning okay. or paying bills, People, I, if you're the owners. Okay. The rest of the fun stuff is 10%. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. And drinking beer is like 0.001%. Okay. That's why they call just it for brewer's people. portion. That's right. Just right? for the people That's who true. think that drink, you know, brewing is this glamorous job. So So now you so so, so you you know you've got the bug. You know you want to be the boss or the mm -hmm. entrepreneur. You're working for other people. Mm -hmm. At some point you're working down in Tustin. Well, yeah, so I went through I started our, my real full-time paying job washing kegs at BJ's in Brea. I okay. uh, had met the brewers at a beer festival, and uh, they needed uh, what we call keg monkey, just mm -hmm. to wash kegs and clean stuff. And I said, done, I'll take it. I uh, love to clean. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the, the manager there said, he sat me down and he said, basically what you're going to do is clean stuff. That's all you're going to do. So don't get your hopes up. You're going to be brewing. You're going to be like whatever. And I said, perfect. I love to clean. Starting at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. it, absolutely. Right. And the best it, way for an owner to start. It was one of the hardest jobs I've ever had. For the first three weeks, I came home every day and just went to bed. I was so <laughs> tired and so dirty <laughs> that I didn't, I just, I would just collapse. It was so physically demanding. Now, had you decided at this point that you were going to go from there to somewhere else to start your own brewery? This, this, this hadn't, because what I'm getting at is you two are partners in more than one sense. But all partners have to speak at some time about what, what the deal is. Mm -hmm. Who's going to do what? 
what the game plan is, whether you both agree with it, and more so if you're married. Sure. So it's one thing to be partners, um, like at the Strand. Right. But it's another thing where, where you've got two fellows with their own families. Yeah. It's another thing to share everything as partners. Yeah. Well, ultimately, I mean, my family are all entrepreneurs. My brother and his wife started a magazine together. My father and my mother started a real estate and construction company together. They're land developers. And so uh, I was raised in a family that always worked together and, and our people often would say to me when we first started working together, how can you possibly spend all day with your husband? If I had to spend all day with my husband, I'd kill him. And I'm like, I love it. Like, I want to spend more time with him because we've, it's, we've always worked so well together. Yeah. I mean, we've... Even as photographers. Yeah, as photographers. We were working we were, as assistants and photographers. We worked for our best friend, Noel, where he was doing you know, digital work and I was a photographer. And it, we've just always had a great balance and a great, great way of coming together and making the other one better and stronger and getting through the hard stuff together. So starting know? this, where you had to invest capital as well, eventually, this was something that you, in, in a sense, already practiced as partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, in a sense, this is not your first partnership venture. No, not right. at all. Right, correct. So that's, that's a good lesson for other partners. Try something small first. Yeah, well, correct. you have to make sure you're compatible. Right. Because I think, I think that you can be married and not compatible in business. And I think you can be married and be compatible in business. But you kind of got to find out what you are. You know, it's, everybody's different, so. I remember a story about these two fellows who were going to co-write a book. And one fellow thought it was on tennis, and so he wrote the chapter one on tennis. And the uh, other fellow wrote the introduction, and the introduction was about cats. Huh. And they, they didn't realize that they were writing different books until they looked at these two <laughs> first products. Wow. Perfect. And they had no idea. They had an outline. They were sharing everything. Wow. So you find that in partnerships. Never, never overestimate how partnery the partners are. Right. Now, do you have any, any written agreement about who does what? No, no. Uh, in our business plan, we had who does what. Yeah, I guess that's plan. true. But it's still yeah. the same. Yeah. yeah. Still the same general sort of thing. There's a lot of overlap. I mean, there was definitely like, okay, you're going to make beer and I'm not. And I'm going to do social media and you're not. You know, but really, it wasn't, I mean, I don't think we, we, we clearly defined what our business needed as an umbrella. And we, we looked and we saw where we were all going to, we were both going to fit in. And then we moved forward. But there was no, like, you know, we didn't sign contracts or anything other than the legal contracts that say our ownership or if he's president or whatever, that right. kind of stuff. But it's, even that, I don't even know what our titles actually are because I don't care. <laughs> I, want to, I want to go back to Tustin for a second, but, but this is a small question. Uh, how are you um, legally organized? Uh, we're an LLC. Okay. Is that what you're asking? Yes, that's yeah. exactly what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. So you're not only president, but one of you is the managing member. Correct. Right. Or you're both We're managing, managing members. We're both, both managing members. members. Okay. Correct. See, I don't even know, but I think that's true. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then that flows through. Uh, the uh -huh. profits and losses here flow through to your personal taxes. Right. Ouch. And, and, um, <laughs> Sorry. And, oh, yeah, they right. flow. Did I say that out loud? Right. They flow. They, they flow they with flow razor sharp edges. Yes. <laughs> And so you, you as as you're as, sure, as yeah. you're both referring to, and as, as I can now say for the video, you're learning that um, you don't want to make too much money at the end of the year without spending some too. Yeah, pretty much. Right. You got to you got to watch the budgeting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you also have to watch how much money you spend, and remember that you're going to have to pay taxes on what comes in. Right. So. Right. Let's go back to Tustin now for a second. Okay, yeah. You're at Tustin. Right, after beginning. BJ's. After, after BJ's. Uh, two, two and a half years at BJ's. Two and a half years. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I started in Brea, and then I moved over as assistant brewer in Oxnard. Okay. So. So he gave, you got what you wanted. You, mm -hmm. you got, you got the, the right to actually make beer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he so, was actually working as assistant brewer under Dave Griffith of Ladyface. The owner of Ladyface. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, oh, really? Yeah, so there was... Uh, the brewer at Ladyface. The brewer. Correct. Yeah, right. and so he was, Dave was the head brewer and Porter was assistant, and they were able to, you know, work as a team there and make beer. And Dave was at the time at BJ's? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. In okay. Oxnard. In Oxnard. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Ladyface is up in Agora Hills. Right. Mm -hmm. And is owned by, I forget their names. Dave Serena. and Serena. Serena, yes. Mm -hmm. I, and, uh, and, yeah, I don't know what and, they're... And Serena's husband. Yeah. Uh, I would assume so. Who's not Dave. Correct. Right. 
John Luke, right, right. who does the finances. Yes. That's their division. She manages the restaurants, he does the finances, and Dave actually brews the beer. Correct. Yes. And the trifecta. what class flow, fr flow machine that is. Right. Okay, so now let's let's move on to Tustin, Just and you're brewing in Tustin, uh -huh. and you realize you want to get a chance to start your own brewery. And this gets into how did you capitalize your own company? Um, in relation to Tustin? Wait, what? Well, you're, you're, you didn't move here for two years. Oh, you're, right, so we started... working there. We started, were, well, so, yeah, that's, that's, now I see where you're going with it. Um, so what happens is we thought, yeah, so <laughs> we don't have a product, we don't have a brand. Well, I just got to pick it up. We don't have a product or a brand. Nobody knows me. That's why we they didn't only like know the exactly. They only know. Uh, hey, that's not fair. We only I know people. People only know my beer because I've been dr dragging kegs and jockey boxes around at beer festivals all around SoCal. For three as, years. Yeah, for three years as the brewer of Tustin Brewing Company, right? So, um, and it's also it was also um, kind of limited because I always had to make the house beers, and then there was. There's a little bit of room for more, but there's only so much you can sell through the bar, right? And we weren't distri distributing anything. So we got the idea, well, why jump in with all of these unknowns, whether the brand's gonna be successful, whether people are gonna like the beer, whether you're gonna be able to run a, a brewery with that, with that huge investment, uh, why not try it out first? Why, right. not, why not see right. if we can make it work and then if it works, then we know that the brewery, uh, an, another facility, and, it, and everything that it involves is viable. So this is almost a little bit of, of entrepreneurship. You're, you're still inside testing. Correct. Yes. When you're doing this. Correct. And this is something that oftentimes they don't teach in business school. They always talk about entrepreneurship, but they don't talk about this, this test drive like you're describing right. Right. at your old employer. Right. Right. Well, I mean, so we were. It has were, to be a win-win situation. How exactly. How do you make it a win-win? We know how it's how it's won for you. Mm -hmm. It's it's the background here. But how right. did it win for him? Um, how did you make it? How did you sell it to your boss? Uh, I mean, I sold it as an opportunity to get the word out about the beer that we were making, and whether it was under under his banner or mine, everybody knew where it came from. It says right on the keg, brewed and packaged at Tustin Brewing Company. Okay. And the overarching plan was for him to be involved and, and, and in this facility and, and grow the, you know, the same way that, that he couldn't in the pub alone. And what's ultimately happened is we're now two years down the road and we're still talking about Tustin. Tustin gets Com right. gets, they right. always get, we always give so much, you know, thanks and congratulations to them because they helped us start and it'll, that'll continue forever. I mean, mm -hmm. they're always going to get that sort of Did love they back. You, when you moved from, you were using their equipment at first to right. brew the first Smog City beers. Yeah. Right. And everything else was uh, ours, like the kegs and uh, the storage and, you know, we used our cars to deliver the beer. Right. So, so we you were paid. slowly sinking capital. Yeah. yeah. From 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 paychecks. Yes. So we paid him for the beer. It was kind of like a contract brew, but right. I hate to talk about it that way because most people think contract brews are a person who doesn't know how to make beer has beer. Someone make them beer and then they go and sell it. But for there, it was me making all of the beer and right. us delivering all of the beer. Right. So it was kind of like contract brewing. Well, yeah, it's it's a spe I, I interviewed Fireman's uh, Brew. Yeah. yeah. And Fireman's, of course, is run by a fellow named David Johnson, who admits he doesn't know how to make beer. Right. Uh -huh. But it is owned by a couple of firemen who were home brewers mm -hmm. and in their 50s or 40s and said, well, I can't quit my big pension plan here. Right. I've got to find. And so Mendocino is their contract brewer. Right. But right. it's, it's, there are gradations of contract brewers. Correct. Yeah. So it, And you're, you're sort of the ultimate... Uh, end of one gradation. I mean, yeah, I'm on one brewer. end of the spectrum. Yeah. The farthest, exactly. farthest right. end. Right, right, right. So. so now, does does Tustin own a part of Smog City? Did they help you with the with the large capital outlay here? No, we ended up sort of splitting, parting ways. Okay. Was that was that easy? Um, no. <laughs> no, it's never easy. It's never easy. Yeah. Right. You know, but. I still considered him my friend, and the, the brewer that was my assistant while I was there is doing a fantastic job down there, mm -hmm. Jared, and I mean, he's got more medals than I do at this point, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so when you made the transition two years ago to here, 
this was a large capital outlay. This was mm-hmm. a lease. You had to you had to find the location, mm-hmm. uh-huh. and um, um, let's let's go back to that in a second about why Torrance. But the first subject I want uh-huh. is where did the money come from to buy the tanks, to buy the first equipment? Fair Obviously, enough. you've expanded a lot. The first time I was here, I don't remember all the barrels. Nope, nope. no uh, barrels. Well, well, there were all, six barrels. A lot of what's in here now is literally money in, money out. So right. That's so what we, we were talking about. Like all of our money we make doesn't go into our pockets. It goes into buying more equipment so that we can grow our brand and you know make it bigger. Right. And we started um, really yeah. small. I, I mean, I bought a brew house uh, from the Marble Brewery. Uh, yeah. This is old. I mean, this is the one we still use, but it's old and kind of beat up and we paid almost nothing for it and we stored it for an entire year because okay. it yeah. came up on the market. Okay. We saved a lot of money. No, it, because of my background, I knew how to shop for equipment and I knew I knew a lot about. We did a lot of the build out ourselves, so we saved a lot of money. Yeah, and he was always just looking for used equipment constantly. When anything came up, the keg washer was at Tustin, and he was like, "This is it. This is it. That's the keg washer." So there and was a lot it. of planning. Oh, for constant. That's yeah. when you moved here. That's why it took so long. Right. Yeah. It did took you, us four years from when, when we knew. When you moved here, do you have to put in new new drainage? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's the one thing you really. New floors, had. new drains. New floors, new drains. Electrical. Yeah, upgrade uh, electrical. Upgrade we electrical. brought in gas, upgraded right. water. Right. Yeah, we put a lot of money into the and building itself. And all of that itself. cost money, but you had saved from your jobs. Yeah, we and there had was, saved, and we there got was some inheritance and we got a, family we, money. We got some loans. Okay. You got We're some able. loans from mm-hmm. the family. Mm-hmm. Line of credit. Uh, what they call <laughs> the, the three F's. Right. Friends, family, families, yeah. and fools. Fools. Right. fools. Who, who could we cut out the fools and we cut out the friends. We okay. kept the family. Kept it with the family. Yeah. Kept it with the family. So it's all in the family. Because ultimately, we really didn't. If you start dividing your your business into investors, yes. you start losing your ability to make decisions, you know, having this omniscient uh, overview of your business. Right. And the ultimate goal for us was to own our business so that when he thinks this is what's right for the beer, we do it. And when I think it's right for the customer, we do it. And most of we the, don't have to answer to anybody. And a lot of those decisions ever. are not that good for the bottom line, but ultimately they are for the longevity of the brand. Yes. And when you have investors... They want to see a return, right? Why else? Right. Why would anybody right. give you money? Right. So, so you do own a hundred percent of Small City, just to clarify. Yeah. And and do you? You know, a lot of people think, oh, if I sell just five percent, or they, they in, in their fantasies they think someone only is interested in five percent, not fifty-five percent. Right. That that'll be okay. Five percent's okay. But it's still another owner, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Still somebody. It's another else personality. To it's another bit of drama. It's another person you have to manage. It's Another person you have to make happy. So, outside of yourselves, long term, and the customers. Mm-hmm. And, it, and a, now a, that we're in, as long as we grow conservatively, we don't have to give away our business. And there's no reason to, you know. And we don't have, we don't have aspira- aspirations to be uh, gigantic. We just want to make a good living, and we want to make great beer, and we want to have, have, fun have doing a, it. and have fun doing it. And have a great brand that people really respond to. So for us, it was like that. We came in small. You know, there are other breweries that have opened since we opened, and they're significantly larger than us. Right. But, but that's not how we want to do it. You know, they, I don't know if we're all more those comfortable with this level. Yeah. We like right. to grow small. Right. Go, grow and the ones, the ones that have opened since are. I mean, I, I think of Golden Road is. Is that only two years old too? Is uh, they were I think they're older us. than us. Yeah. Like Modern Times, St. Modern, Archer right, are two right, really right. good examples. Yeah. They came Big. in massive, yeah. right? right? They came in with a national uh, business plan. We came in with a city business plan. Right. Like we really, and we, we still, we're only in LA, OC, Tiny Bit and Ventura. We haven't even left our home turf and we don't, we think that it's most important to dig really deep into your home, home uh, community because once, if things don't go great in the future for craft beer, you still have that security behind. You still know that you've invested, you know, in this this neighborhood. In the in the in that fifty mile radius, or yeah. in your case, maybe even that ten mile radius. Mm-hmm. This now, why Torrance? You Tor- looked all around. You were in Tustin. You'd been in Oxnard. How did you land in Torrance? Well, we're we're West Siders, North West Siders, like Santa Monica, and then we moved to Venice. And then we moved to Westchester, so we've always been coastal, okay. and uh, and we love the weather, and we love 
the people on the west side. They're yeah. very different than people on the east side or people or Hollywood. in Hollywood or yeah. people in the valley. Right. There's different personality <clears throat> makeups. Now you're down in the South Bay. Now we're in the awesome. South Bay, which is a little different than Santa Monica. It's perfect. I mean, the ultimate, the ultimate answer is we looked across the entire city. Yeah. And one day I went in with my dad or you to talk to oh, Strand. I never, oh, Strand, I thought you meant the city of LA. I think I went in with my dad, I guess. And to I went Strand, and talked to, to Rich. Right, to and Strand, I, Strand Brewing Company, yeah. Strand Brewing. which is also here in Torrance. Yep. Mm-hmm. Rich and Marcello. I went, and I went and sp- spoke to Rick, Rich, and I said, hey, uh, we're looking to open a brewery and just wanted to kind of get your ideas on how you feel about Torrance and what do you think about the South Bay and do you have any ideas? And he's like, you have found your home. And I was like, ah, you're so funny. He goes, no, no, not kidding. You belong in Torrance. You will love Torrance. You need to move your brewery to Torrance. And I was like, what? what is he talking about? So my dad and I get in the car. Uh-huh. We drive over to the city of Torrance and walk into their business or their planning department, which is like the counter is the size of one of our bars, or part of our bar. And uh, two guys came out and they said, how can we help you? And we said, well, you know, we're here because we wanted to sort of look into opening a brewery in Torrance. And they were like, yes, craft beer. And my dad and I were like, this is, we obviously have found our home. And Rich was absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Now this was this was before Monkish. Monkish had um, Monkish had not opened. No, Monkish had opened because then I went and spoke to Henry. Right. Okay. So Monkish had we were just, just opened. Okay. It was like March, right? Monkish he's a year is older about than a us. block and a half from here. Yes. True. A year older in terms of, of this two year anniversary. <laughs> yep. Right. And the, yeah. and, the, and the Strand has been there for four years, five years. Uh, five. And it's is, is not is not as close as Monkish by a long shot. Right. right. And then and since then you've had the dudes locate another block away. Right. Right. So we've got we've got three breweries right here within spitting distance, and then the Strand is building out um, uh, just across the road, so mm-hmm. to speak. Yeah, just down the way, and then Absolution, Absolution is just across too. the bridge. Right. So so we've so before. And Red Car is before is, is we, a brewery oh yeah, and then of course Red yeah. Car, the original, the original, right. the, uh, the original, the original Torrance, Torrance uh, brewery. Yeah. Yeah. And so, City of Torrance, open arms. My dad and I had already gone to speak to the city of LA, and they were less than uh, welcoming yeah. and enthusiastic. And so we knew Torrance was it. So then we started looking, and I was kind of the forefront of looking for a place because he was working, he was brewing the Tustin beers, he was brewing Smog City beers. Okay. We were both so picking up kegs and delivering. Was already apparent. It was already happening, yeah. and I we he would bring home kegs to me, put them in our fridge. I'd put them in my car. I'd drive out and deliver, and then I was searching for locations, and um, I found one actually right behind Monkish. And Porter and I went over and spoke to Henry and said, "If we move in right behind you, would you be upset?" <laughs> and he said, mm, "No." He's like, I think it'd be all right. Mm-hmm. I think it's all right. And then that place didn't work out. That's it was a little too small. Henry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a different street. We were new. We had side. never met him before. Oh, it was oh, literally, fancy. we walked yes. in. We walked in and we're like, hey, we're, you've never, uh-huh. you've never met personally. He knew of Porter, but we'd never you actually met face well, to face. As long as you don't do Belgium? Yeah. No, he didn't no. say that. Okay. And, and then <laughs> that place didn't work. We searched, 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 and then we found this place. And I walked in. I walked through the office that you came in, walked mm-hmm. into this room. And it was just a big open warehouse. And I saw the roll-up door and the roll-up door in the west to east breeze coming off the beach. And I was like, this is our house. This is it. I knew it. I called him up and I'm like, I'm standing in it. You have to hurry up and get off of work and come see it because I found it. <laughs> it's true. And then now we're here. So, so um, you know, one of my first, uh, I think I had been here first, but my other first exposure to you all was, what's it called? The Tavern and... Culver City, what's oh, that? Tavern on Main. Tavern on Main. And city, I was city in tavern? there. And Not I city said, Tavern. Uh, in Culver, oh, in Culver, Culver City. City. Oh, sorry. city Tavern? City, city tavern. tavern. Okay. And I said, what local <laughs> beers do you have? And, and they named off a bunch, and then Smog City. And I said, well, I'll take the Smog City. And the bartender then told me a story. He said, yeah. oh, these guys are great. I said, well, <laughs> why do you say that? And I said, have you met the brewery? He goes, oh, no, no, I never met that guy. <laughs> but his wife comes in with her 79-year-old mother, and these two skinny girls. She's she's cart. 73. 73. Yeah, okay. Don't, don't say 79. In the she story, might she, she might roll was 79. over. <laughs> okay. Oh no! 
<laughs> don't say that. Rewind. <laughs> My mom's going to cry. Please don't say 79. My mom will watch this eventually. My mom would sob. Okay, 73, and at the time, probably only 60. 69, 68, something. Yeah. Young. 70. Young. Yeah, young, young. And, <laughs> and, and these two, but he did describe you as skinny, would carry the kegs. Well, in that's themselves. right, I hope. Unless I've gained some weight. And deliver them and tell us all about this genius husband. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, I looked at him, I said, that sounds pretty good. He goes, he goes, yeah, she's one of the better salesmen I've ever met. Ah, that's nice. Perfect. I love hearing that. So <laughs> this idea that you were self-distributing wow. yeah. for how long? A year and a half. A year and a half. Was very productive. Absolutely. It, it was an education for all of your customers, yeah. or at least those people who are in between you and your customers, yeah. the bartenders. And yep. for us. And, and for, for us too, to get mm -hmm. to know them, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I often would, uh, I would deliver with my five or three and a half year old, yeah. and I would have is to that carry. How old he is now? He's five now. He's five, five and a half. Right. So I would have to deliver with a tap handle, an invoice, and my keg. And I, up until I got my keg dolly on Mother's Day from this guy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> knows that you have a life of beer ahead of you. Oh boy! That's just that's not just, a vacuum cleaner. Like a, but no. a keg dolly, or a bottle of champagne. Oh, oh yeah, keg dolly. Chocolate vacuum champagne. cleaner. That? <laughs> so I would deliver with my son, and I'd have all these kind of working parts. I have to make sure my son is safe. And so I would give him the tap handle and the invoice and say, go give this to that guy. Because I knew if, I handed, if my son handed an invoice to them, they had to pay it. Right, right. And so my little three and a half year old would walk down the thing with this little thing, you go, this for you. And I'd come in with my keg. And, and those stories persist. I mean, they still tell those stories yeah. to people because yeah. you make an impression. They don't soon forget you when you're yeah. delivering beer with a three and a half year old. No, <laughs> yeah, when you're delivering your own beer with your mother or with a three and a mm -hmm. half year old, because I heard this story mm, at least a year ago, I think. So you were probably still, you're probably at the very end of self distributing. In fact, two I think, years ago, we stopped self distributing. I, I think I yeah. came here after that again, and that's when you, you told me Stone was going to be your distributor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Stone is, is, Correct. is Stone Distribution is yep. distributing yep. now. And so just. To yeah, say yeah, last yeah. week, my mother helped me deliver beer. So ah, again, <laughs> yep, she was out there delivering kumquat saison with me. Outside, outside of the Stone territory. I uh, well, or as a special Stone doesn't go or uh, kumquat saison didn't go through Stone because it was a small batch. Okay. So we had to self distribute it. So you're still self distributing small batches. A little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. Batches. Every once in a while, yeah. and it, and it's honestly, it is such a huge benefit to our business to get back out there. I mean, I I loved it. I went out yeah. and I met all these off premise retailers, bottle shops. Is what I mean. To go back um, and be a salesman. Cause, yeah. Because most entrepreneurs not even start a salesman. A salesman. Well, you're also not a even selling. No. You're selling your brand, right? right. You're not selling beer because I would call them up and say I only have 30 accounts that are going to get these oh, Domino's is showing up for the place perfect <laughs> um, I would be like you know, I call them up and say hey this is Lori from Smog City I have this special beer and they'd say how much so like how many can I have so I'm not selling I was literally just delivering, delivering. beer delivering. but what it did was, was gave me an opportunity to meet them again and to get to know them and to put my face in front of them and to be a person, you know, because well, our I brand mean, is family-run. Uh, when you family go out run. And, and sell, uh, it's, it's a, a perhaps not the best word, but you're going out and meeting your, yeah. your customers again. You're going out and meeting the people who are paying the bills and collecting Correct. information. For how many employees do you have now? Uh, six, six full-time. Okay. So, so at first, I rem I have, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, there were other people here other than you two, but they were still interns. Mm, we had one guy, but he, he worked for us. No? We paid him. Yeah. And then he actually uh, moved to Oklahoma, Oklahoma to work at Lucky Bucket Brewing. Okay. So, but we haven't had any interns. You picked interns. up Chris at one point and, yep. and um, uh, the fellow... Tall the, Ryan. Tall Ryan. Yeah. And I can, <laughs> I can remember Tall Ryan here behind the counter <laughs> yeah. from my first visits. Absolutely. Yeah. He's so still here. That going to payroll is a big, big event, though. Yes. I mean, as, as long as you don't have to pay anybody and all the money you make goes into the equipment and whatnot and the lease, but then all of a sudden, payroll and, your, and the taxes and the bookkeeping and yep. the California rules and posting yeah, those things on the back of the bathroom door. It's all terrible. Right. It's, it's terrible. All terrible right? It's all terrible. Right. <laughs> that was a big decision. It's, it's... Well, it wasn't a choice. 
Right. He couldn't brew enough beer. We still, with six employees, we still can't brew enough beer to meet demand. So we didn't have, if we hadn't have grown, if we hadn't have added employees, we wouldn't be growing and he probably would be broken, you know. It's, you just do what you have to do for your business. You're protecting the franchise. Yeah. Something like that. But what do you, you, what would you do? I mean, it's your business, it's your, it's, this is our life. Like, right, right. We have to take the hard, make the hard choices. Same thing we do with our beers. Is it best for the beer or is it easy? It's best for the beer. Is it best for the brand or is it easy? It's best for the brand. You, right. you just you don't have a choice. So. Are any of the are all the employees working in operations or do you have any any employees out doing sales backing up your distributor? We have one sales rep. Okay. Who's out there? One, one small Ryan. Foot on the street. We small have Paul Ryan, Ryan and Small okay. Ryan. Small and tall. That's going on record. Perfect. <laughs> They're, they're both okay with that. They're both okay with their names. But he's out there. He's our, our face, you know, on the street. He's mm-hmm. the guy out there um, making sure that accounts are being taken care of. And right. Find your first customers. Was it just... Because well, Tustin wasn't selling anything outside of the brewery. I think so you mostly had to go around and... Library. Well, they're mostly library friends. Alehouse. Yeah, I think Library yeah. Alehouse was one of our uh, first deliveries. Library Alehouse on May. And to this day, he's our second best account in our distribution, it's like, true. he still is one of our, like our sec, literally our second best account. Let's talk about your beers though for a second, because we we've talked about Henry, Henry Wynn there at Monkish, and he is strictly Belgium. We could talk about um, El Segundo, who really is getting well known for for um, hammering out IPAs, big time. <laughs> nice. Um, and, 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 and we've got a variety. We could talk about um, um, Phantom Carriage and their Sours sure. and their Brett beer. But I think of Smog City as not quite able to be categorized because you're doing everything from, from great IPAs, your Amar- Amarilla Gorilla, mm-hmm. uh, for instance, uh, to these Kumquat and, and other, uh, what's, the, what's the berry one, the, the grape? Black grape? Current. Black currant. Oh, the grape ape. Grape ape. Grape ape. Little bow pills. Little bow pills, right. You, so it's quite I mean, a variety. I think that, that that's something you should speak to, but it's the brew pub mentality, right? Yeah. Having I mean, a good background. The thing is that, like, ha- trying to have something for everyone, especially here in the tap room, we run it like it's a brew pub, and brew pubs traditionally always had something from light to dark and a few in between to sort of please all palates. We kind of do that, and then um, I think some of the brands that are more successful got traction because there were less people doing them making them or at least making them as well as we were um i mean we were making other styles when we first opened uh that we you know yeah that we've discontinued we we don't make all the time Mm -hmm. um but again it's like variety is the spice of life you know we get bored too so you'll see like a belgian triple on the board sometimes and we have some sour beers Mm -hmm. on their way Mm -hmm. and so we do a little bit of everything it, it makes it interesting, and it also gives us a chance to sort of spread our wings in terms of uh, conquering different styles and techniques and things like that. And you know, and it really shows the brewing acumen of our brand. How much? Because you you were the original brewer, and now you've got Chris. Uh huh. And um, are you still calling yourself head brewer, or what? What do you call him, master brewer? Brewmaster. I don't, master. I don't know brewmaster. what to call myself. This is yeah. brewmaster. <laughs> and, and, and I keep how, trying to force him into that title, but he does does, something like do, that. do you and Chris Humble. collaborate on everything, or, or uh-huh. do you have do you have him doing some things and you doing some things? Mm-hmm. Is there, is does he get a, you know, this this idea that the entrepreneur eventually the entrepreneur starts off doing everything. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, eventually has to replace, like you have someone going out to meet customers, which yep. is what you did. You've got somebody else brewing, which mm-hmm. is what you did. And, and many entrepreneurs never hand off that, that other responsibility. I can think of a few other, some of the oldest brewers in town here are still doing what they were doing 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. True. And far side of the town. Other right. side of downtown. Right. I think there's, I mean, we talked about this in the beginning of our business about the concept of building, building a, a brand that is solely on the shoulders of one person right. or building a brand that has a strong team set where if, if he were to walk away for a week, the brand still survives. The beer still gets made. And so even though the, the actual like 
um, origins are in Porter, then we had to create this like strength out there because he can't be the only one doing everything. Right. Unless you, again, don't want to grow. But we, I think if they call it like key man syndrome or something, right. where if there's, there's only one key man, what happens if the key man goes away? Right. What happens if he decides he wants to go run off into the woods and live in a hut? Or then it's, Smog it's sometimes City called ceases. the Mack truck question. Mack truck, was that? Well, they, they, it's uh, someone's looking at your company, and um, they come up with a question. They say, well, I'm going to invest with you, or I'm going to I'm going to make you my my vendor. And then they say, now, Porter, what happens if you walk across the oh. street and the Mack truck hits you? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we talked about that a lot in the beginning. Plan? How safe is my money? Yeah, we spoke about that in the beginning. Like, what happens if anything happened to him or to me? Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't want Smog City to just be Porter. Do you have life insurance policies that would take care of that? Uh, have we you have, gone that we far? have massive insurance on the business. We don't have key man insurance on well, ourselves. Well, here's the thing. I worked for several companies where they also had that problem with every employee. And so they made sure that whatever you did, you documented so that if you walked out on the street and you got hit by a okay. bus, someone else could pick right up and do that. Now, I don't think that that's as easy with my position, right. but I try and take the lead and teach them what I know and do things the way I do things. A lot of it is learned, some of it is by the book, but I think so do that... You have process manuals for each of the positions here? Do people have titles and have you created... No, it's, building it, those. it's more organic. So it is difficult. It's so, so time-consuming. It's yes, more it organic it's than that, too. Itself. Mm -hmm. It's more organic than that because the, because our processes of, are still evolving. Right. We make and changes. Intuition, right? We it's changes like weekly, and and then the things that are unexpected that you can't get out of a manual. I mean, do I you think consciously think about cross training. We do cross train. Or, in in, in oh, the yeah. sense that, that nobody here is just washing barrels. Correct. Yeah. Right. We do cross train everyone. Right. That's why we have a small, very nimble team. And I, I'm not sure quite how that pans out when you get bigger. But then, if you're taking one beer and you're making that one beer all, the same way all the time, as long as you have the process control in place, right. then the knowledge of the individual brewer is less important. So with the scale quality. with scale and equipment and sophistication, that gets more important and easier. Right now, it's a little bit tougher. Yeah. Budgeting and working capital. Let's get down to some nitty-gritty here, of, of which is bookkeeping. Because as you said, Lori, and, and I've seen enough brewery financials to know this to be true, the money that comes in immediately goes out to either raw materials, mm -hmm. new equipment, mm -hmm. which is sort of the third choice, feed on the street to sell what the raw materials is making. Yeah. And of course, because there's a lag between getting paid and having to pay for raw materials. In other words, there's a lag to getting paid for product between right. making new product. Right. How are you guys handling that? What kind of spreadsheets are you using or software? Orchestrate beer, Wait, Excel, no. who's have, on top of that? We have QuickBooks okay. and we have a single distributor. And our single distributor, Stone, uh, they, do, they send us a check once a month. So we're not like, we're never waiting 60 days to get paid, we're never, Panicking. And we're not and chasing then, people for money. And we're not chasing people for about money. Distribution. That was a huge, huge. Like when we were deciding whether to self-distribute or go with a distributor, that was a major factor. Is that we would no longer be making those phone calls and those emails trying to chase the money. We had one person right. to chase the money on. And the other side um, is that our tap room creates instant capital weekly. So for me, I believe a tap room is absolutely the bones of making your small business work in the first couple of years. I mean, people come in, they spend their money, I get a, I get money in cash, you know, that goes into my till, and then I get credit card deposits, sometimes every day, you know, and so. Let's just spell it out for everybody. Just, just in case sure. there are people watching eventually that don't get this. Right. You're in the brewing business, uh -huh. and this is a small manufacturing plant. Somewhat like a safer than usual chemical plant, because what is happening here is mostly hydraulic engineering or hydraulic chemistry that ends up making beer. Then that beer can be sold under California ABC rules here and where we are here, which is the tap room. Mm -hmm. Right. The beer that is sold here in the tap room has no transportation costs. No bottling or canning cost. 
It is sold directly from a keg, I would guess. Uh -huh. You're still putting it in a keg. So your only cost is actually the rental on the keg that you've got in-house. And the production of the beer. And the production and the employee, of the beer. The and the employees. And the staffing the utilities. for the bar here, the, the bar but, staff. But which significantly is smaller different. than Six, retail. So the, the margin yeah. on that versus the margin on sending out a keg to a bar or bottling and sending those out, yes, you can expand to innumerable bars and innumerable grocery stores. Right. And this is somewhat limited. Right. But the margin here is what versus the margin on those two other things? Depends on the beer, uh, really. Okay. Why? Uh, because of the, what it costs to make the beer. Mm. Some, some take longer, and, some have and more ingredients. One of the reasons, yeah, well, one of the reasons why a lot of our super wacky specialty beers or with crazy ingredients that are expensive only stay here is because of how expensive they are that we wouldn't make any money if we distributed them. Yeah. Right. So we have to have the margin on re direct to retail. Sure. So. I, I don't mean, know what the numbers are. I don't know what It's the, big. Yeah. The, Go back to what you the were saying. The profit we make here yeah. is bigger than we make in a retail and sale for sure. And it's, and it's instant. It's instant. It's, it comes right. to our hands and goes. I'll, although I will say, when we opened, we opened our doors here to the public. We soft opened in April. We opened our grand opening in May. And between May and June, even though people knew about us, the flow of people in the tap room was fairly small. Like our, our grand opening was huge, but the flow of people was like pretty modest, especially compared to now. Mm -hmm. The minute Stone started distributing our beer, our our you know attendance here went up. And I think that it is it is integral to have your beer in the market to okay. bring people in bring because people in. they don't even right. know. Right. Like somebody sits down, you go into City Tavern. What beer do you want? I want a Smog City. What's Smog City? Oh my gosh, they're in Torrance? That's 10 minutes away from here? I'll go visit. Right. But if so they never see it's not a loss beer, leader to sell out it's of the other bars, but it's, it's marketing like advertising. It's marketing. Extra, extra. Yeah. It's like advertising. It's and hard it's, to value, but it's definitely valuable. And you're open, you're open here in the tap room five nights a week, five, five. afternoon and nights. Yes, exactly. Okay. And you have an average now of, now I would have said when I was here a year and a half ago or so, a year ago, yeah, maybe an average of 20 a night. But I'll, 20 yeah. people? Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. bigger, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's much bigger. I hope so. Yeah. We probably I, I have... I don't know how many people. But, but was that what it was like in the beginning? 20. Um, yeah. In the very beginning, it was 20. Well, we and then, were, I mean, we went we out about 100. We always estimated. We only opened... 100 night. people, yeah. We only yeah. opened three days a week when we first opened. Yeah, that's true. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Friday Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And just so the students can do some numbers here, 100 a night... With an average bill of who knows what? $10? $10? Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Probably average. Are people refilling a growl or two? Yeah, Tomorrow? I mean, sometimes. There's and the, that might make a twenty dollar. There's the ten dollars and there's the twenty seven dollars. Okay. But a hundred, a hundred a night at, at say eighteen dollar average or or fifteen dollars average yeah. adds up yeah. when the margin could be in the eighty or ninety percent range. Mm -hmm. Versus the distributing out. Giving there. away all our secrets. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> These are secrets of all breweries Everyone that have knows. a tap room. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And so, I mean, for us, the you distribution. Need this is yeah. this is the secret of running That's a business successfully. And what Lori's been referring to is is you can afford now to spread your wings right. because of the cash flow that's coming from the tap room. But the proportion of your um, income that comes in through the tap room, it can only increase to the point of how many people you get in here. Right. If you keep making more and more and more and more beer, you're Thank still you. only getting that, you know, 30%, 20% margin that you're, you know, from the distributor. Right. So, it, it's, it, you hit a point where it's like, it's almost... You max out. Yeah, you max out the tap room and then... I mean, imagining a hundred people in this tap room is, is sort of maxing me out. Yeah. Well, not a hundred people at one time. Okay. Hundred people night. over right. five right. hours. Five yeah. hours. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Good correction. Okay. What about what about another satellite, Smog City? What about a, a a satellite in Santa Monica or Anaheim or Newport Beach? Or yeah. I mean, it's possible. ABC allows satellite that now, tap room. right? Yeah. 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 We're considering it. We're looking around. I mean, we're we want to make sure that this business is healthy and. We make sure we find the right location, the right, you know, 
don't know, the right Yeah, because that's, a, that's like another part of the business where you need a manager and people to work. And we it's work really beer. hard. And it's a lot of beer. <laughs> a lot of beer. We work really hard to make sure that everyone that works in this tap room is extremely knowledgeable. And I think that makes a difference between, you know, our tap room and some other breweries. Like, we really engage with the customer here. We do a lot of education, especially about our beers. Yeah, I notice you're really well organized here in terms of both your production schedules and your workers' schedule. Right. And of course, yeah. the two are intertwined. Yes. Yeah. What you're producing and who's here, but also who's here behind the bar. Right. right. Um, what? Um, let's 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 um, let's talk a little bit about that that expansion. You mentioned it before a little bit. Um, are you doing this to grow this and sell this someday? Are you doing this? because the asset will have great value and you're going to keep it? Or is this a, a not a business, but a livelihood? Is it an asset? Is it a livelihood? I think, I think it it's all of those things. Mm -hmm. But most important, it's our lives and we don't really have a choice. Like, this is what he this is what he has to do. Like, this is, yeah. maybe, maybe he could go on to do something awesome. I mean, I we've always joked that whatever he well. put his mind to, that he would do very very well and he would be amazing at but but really like this is our life like we it's also an asset I mean we have all that stainless steel it's not depreciating it's we've got a brand equity it's all worth something right, right. but equity. but we don't think about that really like we're only three and a half years in what we think about is how we're gonna grow it how far we're gonna grow it can we afford to put our kid through college and and then eventually we'll make decisions on the end game but it's a livelihood, I think. Will it's a lifestyle. What's his name? Emmett. Emmett. Will Emmett be going to brewer school? We can just know. we can just let him work with the guys. Yeah, he'll That's just right. That'd be here. enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about about we we talked about who you went to for help, and one of the things that I see about craft brewing is that um, these again these undercapitalized little businesses are beating the oligopoly, not by competing against each other, mm -hmm. but by cooperating with each other. Mm -hmm. So you went and, and you found Henry Wynn very helpful. Yeah. You went and you found Rich at Strand helpful. Mm -hmm. Who else is, and, and, the, and your friends at Tustin Brewery mm -hmm. were helpful. And, um, and your old buddy who now is brewing at Ladyface, David. Who, who have you been helpful to? And, and um, who else has been helpful to you? Talk um, about the, the area here. I mean, anybody who asks for help, really. Anybody who has a question about how did you do this? How did you, most of the time it's dealing with the government, uh, either federal or state, getting through the process. Or when an inspector asks them about some piece of brewing equipment and they don't know what the right answer is to get their <laughs> business open, things like that. Um, I know I talked to, um, I cannot remember. Uh, McLeod yeah. uh, came and 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 uh, I don't Jennifer know. Jennifer or, or uh, Alistair? Uh, Alistair. 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 Yeah, and That's they right. came down. They were asking a lot about right. equipment and talking. You know, what did you do when the inspector said this about your drains or your vents? Right. And you know, and they they had a lot of issues with the city of Los Angeles. It took them a lot longer to get through when they started. Yeah. This craft beer movement, uh, this sub industry that's taken market share from these gorillas. The textbook says this shouldn't happen. The textbook says the gorillas should have killed you guys on price. Why has craft beer overall been so successful? I think there's no one answer, right? Because if we knew, then we would just take that and port it to other places. But sure. I think that it's a societal change. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think price is the most important thing anymore. Mm -hmm. I think where your people are thinking about where their food comes from and who's making it. And, you know, there's a lot of factors that influence that change. But, I mean, you see the giant retailers, too, that are switching to more organic, more locally grown stuff. Even, like, Walmart and those stores have, have to answer to this sort mm -hmm. of changing of people's opinions and wants and, mm -hmm. and buying patterns, right? really. Right, right. And ultimately, beer is a extremely social um, okay. product. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so people want to socialize. They want to know each other. They want to know their producers. They want to talk about beer. They want to. It's like a, it's an experience. It's not That's just an interesting drinking. Interesting point you know? because you could say food is social too. It but is. Then, but then there's this subcategory called fast food, 
which isn't necessarily social. It's fast. Right. True, but there's not really fast beer. No, you know, there's there, not fast beer. Or maybe there's Budweiser, which is right. fast, would be the equivalent. And I would say that McDonald's has as much market share as Budweiser has as much market share. And then the farm to tables, you know, right. those are charging right. premium pro- premium prices. They're growing. They're, they're spreading throughout the city. They're popping up. But they're not gonna they're not gonna dominate the market. Well, people used to buy a six pack of Bud and just guzzle it. Mm-hmm. And I don't see anybody guzzling craft beer. They're, no. they're taking it up and savoring it, tasting it, and that's true with with craft foods. Yeah. Now you've got you've got Heinz and Kraft food, the, the, the pumpkin craft and K, that are right. that are merging now. Right. And uh, uh, coincidentally, I think the same Brazilians and Warren Buffett that funded some of the InBev uh, acquisition of, of, of Anheuser Busch are behind it. So uh, maybe they see some potential. Oh, maybe they see some cost cutting potential. Yeah. For sure. But that's going to open the doors for other food movements like craft beer has been for beer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what's the end game here? You know, are you, are you running a business? Are you building up an asset? Or is this a livelihood? A way to put food on the table? Uh, you, you are different than some other brewers that don't have children. You've got a family started. Mm-hmm. Is it all in the family? Is this going to be three generations out, the porters? I don't know. I, I think, I mean, you ask, is there an end game? Is, there an as- is it an asset? Is it a livelihood? And it's all of those things. You know, we. We have all those tanks, and those tanks are assets. We have a brand, the brand's building. You know, that's an asset that's, that, that has value. But ultimately, I mean, we, this is our lives. This is how we live our lives. I don't really think that he wants or could do anything else as well. I mean, this is like, this is where he is just such is a, a he's such a mad genius. No way, he's a mad genius. It's amazing. It's like when you see that mad scientist come out and the, the creativity that gets to be combined with this sort of innovative engineering spirit or scientific spirit, I think he found the perfect niche, you know? Well, that's what's so alluring about making beer, especially craft beer. It's that it's a combination of many things and it. It keeps your interest for sure. I mean, it's, it's brewing science. It's, it's always changing. It's cooking. It's... It's flavors, it's ingredients, it's raw plumbing. materials, but it's also plumbing, electrical, <laughs> uh, fluid dynamics, heat transfer coefficients, like just so many things, so many, so much opportunity to learn and engage. And uh, I don't know, it's just very fulfilling. And so the end game is, like I said, make, keep making a great, product and have fun doing it and hopefully make a living at it and that's that's kind of how it was when we started are you two having fun yeah. most of the time most of the time sometimes we're not <laughs> yeah no, we, well, of course of course it's amazing it's important There's, to have fun with whatever you do and we've been talking today with Lori and porter porter of smog city porter. brewery porter, porter. <laughs> here in the city of torrance uh, wishing them a happy second or three and a half anniversary. Perfect. And I hope you have a great party on Saturday. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. 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 Go homegrown. XOXO homegrown.